I'm pumped, y'all, because of who he is and, yeah, what he's done. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a weird message. It's okay. It's okay. I want, I want, I want y'all to understand pretty much what God has said and what God has done, and I want to encourage you in the Lord this morning. I really just want to encourage you, and I, want, I need you all to hear me. I need you to hear uh, what I'm saying. I need you to hear what Paul was trying to teach the church at Colossae this morning. So let's open our hearts to be receptive to God. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 2. And jump down to verse 6. Let me rehash last week, and then we're going to move ahead. Man, Derek, you blessed me with that statement this morning. Yeah, you blessed me. Katani and I are doing great. Because of the teaching. (laughs) We're doing great. I need to apply it to my life, and I'm applying it to my life. And I hope homes are being restored and lives are being changed as a result. Let us pray. And then we're going to walk to this. Mm. God, we love you. We came in the cold weather to hear from you this morning, God. So God, speak through me to your people that they would be encouraged, that they would be motivated, that they would be who you would have them to be, God. So I thank you for you. I thank you for what you're doing, for what you've done, for being the mighty God that you are. So, Lord, may the power of the Holy Spirit reign preeminently in this place, that lives would be changed, that people would be motivated to go on and be all that you would have them to be. Hmm. Speak to me, God. Felix moves out of the way. So, Holy Spirit, you could be God. So, we thank you for you. We worship you, we adore you, we bless you, we magnify your name. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Um, Let me just begin here briefly and then I'm going to, I need to back up to verse 6. And I need you all to be, bear with me as I read verses 6 all the way through 15 um, to just review briefly what we shared on last week. And then I need to read, and I'm just going to let the text speak for itself, uh, because I want you to walk out of here with a, um, what's the term I'm looking for? A holy sanctified attitude. (laughs) Yeah, that um, you're going to make it, and that you are victorious in Christ. Now, uh, if you've accepted Christ in your life as personal Lord and Savior, uh, I need to repeat after me, say, God, God, thank you for saving me. And... Say to say, God, God. thank you for empowering me. And I like this one. Say, God, God. thank you for accepting me. me. Yeah, thank you for accepting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and let me just say this before I go into introduction, because this is just heavy on my spirit. I want y'all to walk out of here with that thing um, on 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 the thing. In your relationship with God. Um, it doesn't matter where you are on the continuum of your trajectory towards Christ. Don't make nobody make you feel less than. One more time. On your trajectory with God, it doesn't matter where you are on the continuum of, let me add a word, sanctification. We're all trying to get to God, and none of us in here are there yet. Because if you were there, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, you'd be raptured up and you'd be gone like Enoch. So by virtue of the fact that you're still here and I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, that means you got issues just like me. Yeah. (laughs) And we're working it out. So here's what I want you to hear me say. Don't let nobody make you feel less than on your spiritual journey. Okay? We're going to get there. We're going to get there when God says we're there and God's going to do what God needs to, to do. So... The problem, um, briefly, with the church at Colossae, uh, well, let me back up. The authors didn't specifically tell us um, what the specific problem that the church at Colossae was dealing with. 
fact of the matter is, heretics were invading the church, and they were trying to make the Colossian believers do things that they, weren't, that they should not be doing. They were trying to make them hang on to traditions, and let me just go here, Old Testament stuff that they shouldn't be hanging on to because of, because of the fact Calvary was enough to protect them from the world. And they were victorious in Christ, but the, the heretics were trying to keep them in bondage from walking out this freedom that God has given them. So Paul writes this letter to try to address or to try to lay some theological foundation on what actually happened on, Cal on Calvary. This is why we've entitled the series Christocentric. He's really trying to get them to understand that Jesus truly is at the center, okay? And if Jesus at the, is at the center, there's a whole lot of growing up that should be taking place in all of our lives. And we spoke about this pointedly on this past Wednesday, especially the depth of what that means. The things that I used to do yesterday because of where Christ is, ought to be able to get over that stuff. Yeah. Ought to be able to stop it. Ought to be able to grow. Ought to be at the next place in my spiritual journey with Christ. So a lot of us don't, don't understand what that means yet, and we're on path to getting there. And so this letter really helps us to understand what God has done. And as we move forth on our spiritual journey, listen to what I'm going to say. It's about a relationship with God, not so much what you do to get to God. Let that settle in. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, not so much what we do to get to Christ. Because here's the deep part of all this. You can't do nothing to make God love you more. Process, just process, process. And take notes, and we'll flesh it out on Wednesday. This is why we do Wednesday in the format we do. I just need you all to hear me this morning. Because if you could do stuff to get to God and to make him love you more, he wouldn't have killed his only begotten son on the cross of Calvary. Because we could figure it out ourselves. And so because we couldn't figure it out ourselves, he came and he paid the price and he died in our stead. So the old hymnist says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson saying, but his blood has washed it white as snow. So I owe God. I owe Christ for what he did for me. Does that make sense, guys? So now look at verse 6 and um, verse 6 of chapter 2. And I'm going to read and I'm explain. So I'm going to do a lot of reading this morning because uh, I want to get to this. You guys are there? Here's what it says. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk in him, and here's what we said last week, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8 says it this way. See to it that no one takes you captive and by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the word, world, but not according to Christ. Let me slow down. Here's what verse 8 says. Don't let nobody come tell you crazy stuff. Let me just summarize it like that, okay? Um, anything that people are trying to get you to do that's not in the Word, be careful. Okay? And don't, don't let people try to tell you to do stuff um, that was for yesterday but it's not relevant today. And I'm going to explain that. This is the critical, pivotal point that, that I want you all to go to lock into because here's kind of part of the heresy that was happening. The Old Testament was full of stuff. And so the heretics were trying to use the Old Testament to their advantage to tell, particularly the Colossian believers, see, it's in the Word, you need to do it. Okay? Now, the problem with the Colossian believers is they didn't have the New Testament written at the time. You see the problem? So they used the Old Testament against them all day long because they didn't have the New Testament. The beauty of what you and I have today is we have both testaments. Oh, come on. And, and so we can measure things through the, the entirety of Scripture to understand what's really going on. And I'm going to hit that in a little while. So he says here, don't let nobody come tell you crazy stuff that don't amount to nothing. Okay? So here's the thing. If somebody tells you, let me just be black and white, you've got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G to be saved, don't believe them. 
Let me tell you why I'm saying that. Because salvation is by grace through faith, not works. <laughs> All right? Just believe. It's that simple. We can flesh it out in Scripture. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I want you all to walk with me. So look at verse 9. For in him, this is deep, the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now, we kind of talked about this Wednesday. And you, if you have been saved, have been filled in him who is the head and rule of all authority. Here's what that says. I need to explain it this way. When you look at Christ, you see God, okay? And when we accept Christ in our life as personal Lord and Savior, and if you look at verse 1, and we stay rooted and build up and establish in faith, we identify with Christ. Okay? We identify with Christ. You don't become God. You identify with Christ. Everybody okay with me? Okay? Now, this is what Pastor Kay was talking about, verse 11. In him, you were also, you, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the, uncir- by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in him you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13. Um, and you were also dead in your trespasses and sin in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive. Come on, say he made me alive. Everybody got to say that. Say, he made me alive. And watch this. Together with him, together with him, together with him, together with him. Don't miss that phrase. I'm in the ESV. He made me alive together with him. Okay? Um, Let me see here. Um, And it says, having forgiven all our trespass by canceling the record of death that stood against him with his legal demands. I've got to say this before I go into the text. Um, Oh, man, I wish my cross was here. I've got a bad habit of doing this. Assume the cross is here, okay? Um, Jesus goes to the cross, and here's how I explained it last week. Uh, The circumcision of the flesh was the fact that he died on that cross, and he left the body of sin hanging on the cross, carrying the sins of the world. And you'll remember me saying last week, right before he died, he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Y'all remember that? And the spirit left the body... And the body was left on the cross to die. Now, here's the depth. The Satan looking at this body on the cross thought it was Christ. (laughs) That's why he was celebrating. Christ had already left. He just left the uncircumcised flesh hanging on the cross. He went into the... Come on, y'all talk with me. Is everybody okay with me? Okay? Now, what I want you to understand... Right at the point when Jesus died on the cross, especially when, when, when he died, if you read Matthew, it says the veil of the temple was rent in twain or rent in two, okay? So here's what happened at the point of his death. There was literally a separation between Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus at the center. <laughs> so... The stuff that you had to do in the Old Testament to get to Christ, it don't work in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, you needed a sacrificial lamb. I know I look goofy because there's no cross. Pretend there's a cross there. In the Old Testament, you had to do all this stuff, works, 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 and I'm going to tell you what the works were in a little while, to get to God, right? In the New Testament, you stop here, Jesus paid it all, there is no work, you just identify, listen to the terms I'm going to use, with the finished work of Jesus on Calvary, and you're in. Man, that'll mess folk up, okay? So here's the entirety of a lot of the epistles of the New Testament. They're talking to these people who had just made it over the Colossians, the Ephesians, the Galatians, uh, the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, all those guys. And they're trying, the heretics are trying to convince them there's no way salvation can be that simple because we had to work so hard yesterday. You trying to tell me it's free and I don't have to do nothing? And that's what Paul was writing about. A change has happened. A change has happened. The problem with the church today is we don't know the change has happened. And a lot of us are still trying to work to get there. So here's Jesus when he met a rich young ruler. You remember him? Um, Come follow me. Um, He says to to the rich young ruler, 
The rich and you look at them, Lord, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, go do what? Sell your stuff, give it to the poor, follow me. And the guy went away sad because he had a whole lot of stuff. Okay? Today, Jesus don't need your stuff. <laughs> he takes away from you what he doesn't want you to have. So let's read this real quick. Verse 13. And you, beating, beating myself, were dead in our trespasses and uncircumcision of the flesh. God made us alive together. What? With him. So when Jesus got up from that grave and I accept him, my old man dies and my new man is raised with Christ. Now, let me clarify some things. I'm not talking about your flesh. I'm talking about the spirit person. All right? I'm not talking about your flesh. This is a very important statement. I'm talking about your spirit person. Okay, because I'm going to end with this. Come on, say, not my flesh, but my spirit. One more time, say, not my flesh, but my spirit. Now listen to this statement carefully. The reason a lot of us cannot grow in Christ is because we're trying to fix the flesh. And God is not interested in growing your flesh. He's interested in growing your spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you with me? Okay. Everybody tracking. So watch this, verse 13, and I'm going to move on. And you who were dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven all the trespass by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with this legal demand. Do you guys see this? This he set aside the element of the cross. I love verse 18. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now, look at verse 16. Okay, put the first slide, my next slide on the screen. Uh, point one, the next one. I just want to put that real quick. Okay, good. Now, look at, look at verse 16. Therefore, meaning as a result of what Christ did, it says it this way. Do not let, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to festival or new moon, and this word tripped me out all week, or Sabbath. And it says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belong to Christ. I'll explain that. I'm going to do it really, really quick. So here's what it says. Christ's finished work on Calvary freed us from the legal requirements of the law. Do we really understand what that means? So here's how I'm trying to flesh it out for you. Legalism is wrong, and I'm going to explain that phrase, but the substance is in Christ, okay? And for those of you that want to know what legalism means, I gave you a little definition. Um, adherence to the law or some formula or dependence on moral law rather than on personal religious faith or a personal relationship with Christ. Legalism is wrong, but the substance is in Christ. Now watch the text real quick. Let me just talk through this. Let no one judge you, don't pass judgment, in regards to food, drink, or with regard to festival or new moons or Sabbath. Let me stop. So here's what this is making reference to. In the Old Testament, specifically in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, there was a litany of um, laws and do's and don'ts that the Israelites had to follow to maintain a relationship with God. I mean, there was a, lit, a litany of festivals. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to probably mess with y'all what I'm about to say. Stuff like, um, you know, the year of Jubilee. Such like, stuff like, um, come on, y'all help me name some of these festivals. Y'all help me. Y'all know these. Give me some names. Passover. Um, all, come on. Who, what's that? Hanukkah. Stuff like, well, isn't that like Christmas or something? I don't know. But, but here's the point I'm trying to make. There was a bunch of Jewish holy days and festivals that they had to observe as a nation of people to develop a relationship with God. Everybody okay with me? Okay? And so, and so Paul now is trying to say to them, 
when it comes to festival, when it comes to new moons, and the phrase new moon has to do with the, the calendar systems, which says the year began when a new face of the moon showed itself. So it, it made reference to the Jewish calendar. The part that really messes me up on this is where it says Sabbath. That really jacks me up because Paul is saying even the Sabbath, which was the seventh day of the week, falls into the same category. Man, that was eye-opening to me. I'm like, bring it on, Seventh-day Adventist. I found a verse. You know, <laughs> you kind of get what I'm saying? This is deep because here's what he's saying. This uh, Track with me. All of that stuff was a prescription that Jesus put together, Old Testament, for you to work your way to develop a relationship with me. So here, since you guys aren't smart enough to shut down your work week on the seventh day of the week, I'm going to put a law to shut it down to force you to come to church. Now, the reason he did that is because church wasn't the person. Church was a building. <laughs> and he wanted them to go to the building because they didn't have sense enough to do it for themselves. And Paul is saying, listen, that stuff don't matter no more. If you were to read New Testament, listen to this. All the laws transition or transfer from Old Testament to New Testament with the exception of the Sabbath. Now, listen to how I'm going to say this. The day of the Sabbath is eliminated, but the principle of Sabbath still exists. Everybody okay with that? The day has been done away. The principle exists. So God still wants us to take a day to worship him. Now what's striking about New Testament theology is since he got up on the first day of the week, the New Testament church made that their Sabbath day. You kind of get what I'm saying? But if you know Christ and you're going to lock into this in a little while, Sabbath should be every day. <laughs> come on, come on y'all. It ought to be every day. Now the thing that I like about this text is notice what it says. These are a shadow of things to come. Come on, say shadow. shadow. Say it again, say shadow. shadow. Y'all can't see this well real quick. Let me, let, me, let me explain it this way. Okay, that light right there has this microphone stand right here, microphone stand right here. To the left of this microphone stand is a long shadow. If I look at the shadow, the shadow tells me, and I know what it is, Somewhere in this room, there's a microphone stand. The shadow is not the microphone stand. Now, if I want to get to the microphone stand, all I got to do is follow the shadow. Does this make sense, guys? And as long as that light stays on and the microphone stand is, 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 is there somewhere in the room, and I follow this shadow, I'm going to get to the microphone stand. Everybody okay with me? I hope you didn't miss the part of it as long as the light stays on. <laughs> the beauty of the illustration is the moment I get to the microphone stand, I can stop following the shadow. And I stick with the microphone stand and I take my eyes off the shadow because I don't need the shadow to get to the mic stand anymore. I've gotten to the mic. I wish I had somebody in here. I've gotten to the microphone stand, so I keep my eyes on the stand, not on the shadow. Here's what Paul says. All that Old Testament stuff was just a shadow to get us to Calvary. Now that Calvary has happened, listen carefully, stop following the shadow. <laughs> so folk talking about you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't go here and you can't wear that. And that's shadow stuff. <laughs> Women ought not put on a man's garment. That's shadow stuff. You ought to go to church on Saturday. That's shadow stuff. If you want to follow a shadow, go for it. I'm going to follow the real thing. <laughs> so watch the verse. Watch the verse carefully. Paul says, these are but a shadow of things to come. And then he says, but the substance 
the Greek word soma, body, the essence, the real thing, he says, is Christ. And look at verse 18. Go to the next one real quick. Put the next slide. I want you all to see this, okay? Next one real quick. Look at this. Security now, this is heavy. This is going to really mess you all up, is in the headship of Christ, not the mystic customs of this world, okay? And so I says, mysticism is wrong. Headship is in Christ, okay? And, and look at how I define mysticism. A belief characterized by self-delusion or dreamy confusion of thought, especially when based on the assumption of occult qualities or mysterious agencies. Old Testament. I should have had them leave that cross. Because people online are going to be like, what is he doing? When I think it was Saul that wanted to find out what God was doing, he went to the witch doctor. And he says, what's God doing? And they went through all this, let me connect it to the new term, Ouija board stuff. And all this mysticism stuff. And all this occultic stuff. And interestingly enough, sometimes God would speak through those things. Interestingly enough, okay? But, but it was an occultic practice, worship of angels, all that stuff that allowed them to see what God is doing or to hear the voice of God. And, and that thing, um, in essence, the people would end up worshiping the thing more than they would worship God himself. So here's what Paul is saying. He's the same argument, okay? New Testament now, security is in the headship of Christ, not in the mystic things that we look at to find out where God is and what God is doing. Y'all aren't trucking with me yet, but you get there in a little while, okay? So mysticism is wrong. Headship is in Christ. Now watch how it connects today. So listen to what he says. Let no one, verse 18, disqualify you insisting on asceticism or the worship of angels, going into detail about visions, puffed up without reason, by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, it grows with a growth that is from God. Let me help you all understand what I'm saying. Ask me what Katani's sign is. Ask me. I don't know. I mean, I'm being honest with you. I don't know. Because I don't need to look at her sign to check for compatibility. I don't have to read the horoscope. <laughs> to see what's going to happen today. I don't need to break open the fortune cookie. Oh, today you're going to get a million dollars. <laughs> I don't need none of that because mysticism is wrong and the headship is in Christ. So let me tell you the importance of that. When you come to Christ in Calvary and you're raised with him, the spirit of God literally enters you. Does this make sense, guys? So if God wants to talk to you about you, He's not going to have you some pagan witch doctor or some astrologist who's studying. I wish I had somebody in here. Or some newspaper columnist who's probably just making stuff up based on statistics, statistical analysis or whatever to tell you today your day is going to be good. If you want to get married, get you a Virgo because or Taurus or this or that. And you're praying, God, send me a man that's a Taurus because I need a bull to lead me. You know, and, and you're going through all this foolish stuff that has nothing to do with nothing and it has infiltrated the people of God. And check this out, sad comment. We believe that stuff more than we believe the God in us. Here's what Paul says to Colossia. Stop reading the columns. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Stop checking your horoscope every day. Stop reading the fortune cookies. Stop listening to that stuff because it was a heretical teaching. Listen to me. To keep them from focusing on what was on the inside. 
This is going to really jack you up. It's no different than going to the prophets of today to hear what God is trying to say to you. Now, if he ain't in here, go to the prophets. But if he is in here, the prophet ought to affirm what he's saying to you. Are you with me? One of the things, I've been married 33 years now. One of the things I've learned about Katani and myself is when she comes to me with a corrective word, I already knew it. I just wasn't listening. And I think you can say the same thing, okay? When the prophet of God speaks to you, it ought to be an affirmation of what you already know you should be doing. I wish I had two witnesses in here. Are you with me? Assuming you know God. So mysticism is not going to get you to Christ. Hear who God is. Does that make sense, guys? Avoid legalistic stuff. Quit trying to do stuff to get to God because Christ prayed it all. Avoid all this mystic stuff. And look at the last one real quick. Look at the last one. Verse 20. Okay, you guys are there? Now, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, if, that third place conditional clause stuff, could also be mean since or assuming that you died. Now, if, if you didn't die with Christ, this stuff don't work. Go and get you your horoscope or whatever you need to do. <laughs> Still ain't gonna work. But if you died with Christ, listen to this. You have a new body, a resurrected body. You have been filled or you begin the process to be filled with the Spirit of God in you. And so learn how to tap into that stuff. So look at what he says. If you die to the elemental spirits of the word, why, as if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to its regulations? This is heavy stuff. This is heavy stuff. Because... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me put it on the ground. Keeping the literal Sabbath does not save me. If I am depending on the Sabbath for salvation, I'm still Old Testament. And works cannot save. Matter of fact, you probably heard me say this before. None of those Old Testament people were saved by their works. They had to wait till Jesus died anyway. <laughs> right? That's, that's what Peter talks about when it says when the veil was ten, rent, he went down into the depths and, and delivered, come on, salvation to all them folk who were kept waiting. That's what that was all about, okay? So if I have died to Old Testament stuff, I can't say don't eat the dietary things that it talks about in the Old Testament because that has no different. Matter of fact, here's how God said it. Everything is clean. Just bless it with thanksgiving and gone and get you some good chitlins. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> bless y'all. Amen. Bunch of sinners eating pork. Um, no. But that has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with your salvation. So notice what people say. Don't handle this. Don't touch this. Don't taste this. Referring to things that all perish as they're used according to human precepts and teachings. I like verse 23. These indeed have appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism of false humility and severity to the body but they are no value, I like this, in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Man. Man. I, I want to say this cautiously because I don't want nobody to misinterpret me. I want to say it cautiously. You can fast all you want. Fasting is an external body thing. Does nothing for the spirit man. We can talk about this, okay? We, Wednesday, we'll talk about this. It's all about discipline in the flesh, right? It's all about discipline in the flesh. Paul kind of presents a funny argument here 
even though I do all that stuff, it still messes me up because change for the believer in Christ happens inside out, not outside in. Because Calvary is all about the inner man being changed to impact the outer man. So if you choose not to watch whatever rated movie, but the inside isn't changed, you know, still has no effect. And prove my point. I know a lot of, whole lot of folk that go to church every Sunday that probably going to still go to hell. Because they have not accepted Christ in their life as personal Lord and Savior. Begin with the inside and let it transform the outside. So if you're going to choose to abstain from something externally, make sure it began internally because then the change is permanent. Okay. One commentator used a hilarious illustration the reason a lot of us can't diet well is because we look in the mirror and we don't like what we see. And so we fast and we stop eating. And when we like what we see, we stop till it come back. But if internally God speaks to who you are, I wish I had somebody in here. <laughs> are you with me? Let me connect it to, to whatever habit, whatever sin, whatever struggle we may have. Um, a lot of us do it or stop for a season because we got caught. Externally. But if it begins with the internal conviction that I am a new person in Christ. I have power over the enemy. I can speak to the situations of my life because in Christ I am new. I've been made a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. The inner person can speak to the external and say, stop it. You kind of get what I'm saying? So Paul is trying to get, and I'm done. I'm Paul's trying to get the Colossian believers to do. Don't focus externally saying you can't go to the movies, you can't sing, you can't dance, you can't have fun. That stuff don't mean nothing because works has nothing to do with your relationship with God. You develop a relationship with God and let the Spirit of God that dwells within you starts to purge everything in you that doesn't look like him. Here's how John says it in John. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me because every branch that's in me bears good fruit. If it doesn't bear good fruit, listen to this, the Father prunes or he cuts it away. If you're trying to stop it and it's not stopping, it's because you're trying to stop it so it won't stop. But if God speaks to that thing. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, here's the depth of the teaching. This is why I appreciated Derek's statement so much. Here's what he didn't say. Lord, I'm so glad you fixed fam. That she stopped doing those things that I don't like, so now I can love her. He didn't say that. He said, internally, God is fixing my eyes to see the creature that I married in spite of who she is and what she does. Her external actions has no impact on my response to God. Oh, I wish I had that's a freeing word right there. That's a freeing word right there. Because you love because God loved, not because what the person does. Here's how I said it Wednesday night. Their action should never impact or dictate your response because of what God has done on Calvary. If you can't love like that, don't blame them. This is where this thing hits the road. Let me tell you why. God loved Felix when he was a knucklehead, doing stupid stuff, running the street, just being a bum. He still died on that cross for me. Yeah. 
He never once said, Felix, when you stop, I'm going to go to Calvary and die for you so you can be saved. He did it while I was yet sinning. He did it. And my sin had no impact on his love or his relationship for me. He did it anyway. And now that I become filled with him, I have no choice but to be like him. That's where this thing hits the road. So here's how I said it. Man, Katani and I are doing better because we're learning how to forgive faster. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. This is good stuff. Next week, next week, I'm going to put the rubber to the road. I'm just going to show you in text what he's saying on how you put this into application. Because all that deep theology does no good if you don't know how to live it out. 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 So let me, let me help you with this one. So I can go to work, and it doesn't matter what my boss does that gets on my reserve nerve. The scripture still says, obey those in authority. So guess what I do? Obey. <laughs> That's how you live this thing out. Person cut me off on the street, or they doing donuts and slip on the snow, and I don't look at them and raise my finger. Say hallelujah. Thank you. And I pray for their safety. <laughs> That's how you live it out. If we're at the place where we're saying, God, these people get on my nerves. It's not about them, it's about you. <sighs> this is some heavy stuff. Let me land a hand, then we're going to pray. Don't let nobody make you feel less than on your trajectory to God. Paul says it this way in one passage, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. So if I have time to tell you where you are not and um, how unspiritual you are, that means something is wrong with me, not you. That's what asceticism is all about. If I'm humble, I don't have to tell you how humble I am. You ought to just see it by the behavior. Everybody okay with me? So here's what I want us to do. I want us just to take a moment in self-reflection. Um, And ask God to create within you a clean heart and renew a right spirit. And if he hasn't already been at the center, tell him to put, help him, say, God, help me to place you in the center of my life. For some of us, that will look like praying for repentance. Some of us, that will look like asking people to forgive us. For some of us, it's going to look all kinds of ways. But whatever it looks like to you, Calvary was enough. Jesus at the center of my life. You see the importance of him being at the center because here he stands, the old on one side, the new on the other. And if we keep him there, we'll stay in the new.